Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our, our Father's Word, Zechariah, remembered of Yah. You know, Father is going to remember His children in the sense that He's returning back to be with us. What a day that's going to be. That's what we look forward to. But He gives us instructions, and as a matter of fact, we closed with verse 16 of chapter 8, the great book of Zechariah. And that verse tells you what it is God expects of you to be pleasing to Him, to really love Him. I'm going to just read it as we, as we open. You won't have it, but this is what we closed with. These are the things that you shall do. If you want to be pleasing to God, this is what you're going to do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. That's to say, in any of your litigation, whether private or public, let it be truth. Truth always prevails, and you'll always win. Why? God will see to it. So if you want to know what pleases God, there it is. Okay, so we get right. This, this chapter, chapter 8, has to do with the restoration of God's children and God gathering back to them. Let's pick it up in verse 17 and finish the chapter with that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. And 17 reads, And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people say, well, God can't possibly hate. Well, He does. He hates lies. He hates gossip. He hates people that spread untruths about neighbors or anyone else. And you guess what? He gets even for it. Why? Because He hates it. You surely don't think you could do something that God hates and expect Him to bless you. Forget it, friend. It's, it's real easy to stay in, in God's blessings. All you have to do is be familiar with His Word and do it His way. And you'll do just real good. Verse 18. And the word of the Lord of the hosts came unto me, saying, another message here, 19. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast, and notice I'm saying fast, sadness, poor me, baby, ooh, hoo, hoo. Fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness. In other words, if you pay attention to what's going on here for the 70 years that I punished you, putting you in shape that I can appreciate you, it should have been a joy, not a fast. Not a poor me baby, but one pleasing to God. And cheerf cheerful feast. It should have been a festival for you, not a sad sack meeting. Therefore, love the truth and peace. And the truth will. It'll set you free. It'll give you a deeper understanding. It'll make you pleasing to God. And guess what? His blessings just flow. Friend, we're not just playing church here. That's reality. And it is an absolute fact that God blesses those whom He loves, that obey Him, that do what He asks them to do, as, as best they can. There's none of us perfect. But He said, I don't want you to be a bunch of sad sacks. I, I want you to make a feast out of it, knowing I loved you, and that's the reason you went into that 70-year captivity. And incidentally, in passing, the fast of the fourth month, you'll read of in the 52nd chapter of Jeremiah, verses 6 and 7, and it has to do with when the city was broken up, Jerusalem, that is to say, and the 
fast of the fifth month was the temple and the houses were burnt. You'll find that in Jeremiah 52 verses 12 and 13. The fast of the seventh month was, as we studied in the last lecture, was when Gedaliah was slain by Ishmael in uh, the 41st chapter, 41st chapter in verse 1 of Jeremiah. And the fast of the tenth month is when the king of Babylon set his face against Jerusalem and usually found in Ezekiel 24 verse 12. Th those were those fasts, and did God appoint any one of them? The answer? Absolutely not. That was all planned out by man. That was man feeling sorry for himself, putting a bunch of sad sacks around whenever God was correcting and bringing their attention to the fact that he wanted them to listen to him. He didn't want them turning his back, uh, their, their backs to him as it mentioned back in chapter 7, verse 11. God doesn't like it if you turn your back to him. Do you blame him? Have you ever been talking to somebody and have them turn their back to you and walk away? It doesn't make you a happy camper, does it? Verse 20, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass, not maybe, not perhaps, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people in the inhabitants of many cities, a crowd, Verse 21, And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Now, <clears throat> sounds real religious, doesn't it? But you know something? You can worship God anywhere. If you're a Christian, God's with you wherever you are. You don't have to run to some mountain or somewhere else. You should, you should be able to recognize the action of man again here. Let us go with you. We hear he's over here. We hear he's over there. This is how what caused a lot of people to be led to the false Christ as Jesus told you and warned you. In Mark 13, he said, they're going to tell you he's in the desert or somewhere else wherever they tell you he's at. Don't you go for it's the false Christ. And he didn't say maybe the false Christ would come first. He said absolutely guaranteed. Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21. All documenting three witnesses that the false Christ would come first to deceive those that want to fly to save their souls. You don't have to understand God's word. You're going to be gone. Yeah, gone in the sack with Satan. What, what, how, how damaging a teaching can be. Let us go with you. We hear God is there. Verse 22. Our Father will never leave you nor forsake you. Don't you ever let some man, some sad sack, come along and try to lead you astray. Verse 22. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. There's one coming, all right, my friend. 23, thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass, not maybe, that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And of course, naturally, do you want to know who the ten men are? All you got to do is read Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. It's going to rise from the mass of people. And naturally, this is, not, this is one that would like to claim to be of our brother Judah, but is not. You want to be real careful, my friend. Man will deceive you. God is everywhere. God is your Father. You, you have His Word in hand. I mean, now, your Father just told you when the sad sacks come along and talk about fast, you feast, you celebrate, you know the truth. And then He comes along and gives you the ten. 
like uh, just just like I said, it's it's real easy. You have ten earthly kings. You have ten in um, in the great chapter of Revelation 17 that come with the false messiah. Chapter 13, verse 1, Revelation, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Horns are power. That's the ten. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy, for it is blasphemy against Almighty God. You know, you don't have to be the sharp, sharpest knife in the drawer to know that you should follow God and not man, that man will mislead you, misdirect you. All the time you had God's word, right? I mean right in your own home, forewarning you, leading you, and directing you. And you would rather listen to some fruitcake that practice traditions of, traditions of men and claims to be. Do you, do you know? Do you know who um, Jesus warned about that uh, that would come bringing deceit? I, I've been quoting from Mark 13 quite a bit, where he said that the false Christ would come first. In the very beginning of his warning, he says, "Take heed lest any man deceive you." Why? He would say later in this, in, in verse 23, but take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. You don't have to go with some man somewhere to find out all things. He's already told you. Through the prophets, have you read it? But he says, take heed lest any man deceive you. And I'm reading the fifth verse of Mark 13. For many shall come in my name. Whose name are they going to come in? Christ's name. I'll be a Christian preacher. I'll be a revolving rev right from Jesus Christ. That's whose name they come in. Saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Just because a person says they're a Christian, just because a person says Christ sent them, doesn't make it so. By their fruits, ye shall know them. Well, how do I test their fruits? Whether they align with this word or not. If they lie to you, it'll bounce right off the pages of the eternal word of God that never changes. He, we have been foretold all things through the apostles and the prophets. Second, Second Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 would tell you the same thing that Christ just told you in Mark 13 about you've been foretold all things of the question, have you read it? That's up to you. Okay, enough said. There's uh, going to be a great misleading right there at the end. People claiming to be something they're not. You just be real true to yourself and stay with God's word and you won't go too far wrong. Chapter 9 verse 1. The burden or the divine declaration of the, Lord, of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach in Damascus shall be the rest thereof when the eyes of man, Adam, as of all the tribes of Israel shall be toward the Lord when they really come there. Now, it's kind of strange, but Hadrach is an Assyrian deity, okay? But that was the land, and Damascus, of course, the uh, city of Syria. Uh, verse 2, And Hamath, this is the same as Hamath, the chief prince of the Kenites, their land also shall border thereby. Tyrus, that's one of the names of Satan. It means rock in the Hebrew tongue. And Zidon, the fishing town right by it. Though it be very wise, three, and Tyrus did build herself a stronghold, she tried, and heaped up silver as the dust and fine gold as the mire of the streets. You know the word Zor Maraz, um, Mazar can hardly be translated to English because the, the stronghold means it's uh, strong with money, 
That, that'd be about the best way you could uh, translate it. It just won't hardly translate to English. But it means strong controlling the economy of the world. Old Tyrus does a good job of it too. Do you know Israel didn't conquer Tyrus? They had to push a levee up all the way out to it. It was such a so fortified. And uh, one of the Babylonian kings took it. Verse 4. Behold, the Lord will cast her out, and he will smite her power in the sea, and she shall be devoured with fire. All it is is a rock anymore. It is gone. God keeps his word. And like I said, it wasn't Israel that destroyed her. God himself saw to it. That doesn't mean that her powers and her systems of money did not were destroyed. They're still worldwide. Verse 5, one of the four hidden dynasties. Ascalon, that's to say the migratory ones, shall set see it and fear. Gaza, same old Gaza as you've got today, right on the strip. All shall, shall, shall see it. And be very sorrowful and echron, torn by the roots. For her expectation shall be ashamed. And the king shall perish from Gaza. You know where that is. And Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. It's going to be a change. And here again comes the warning of the sitting of the false messiah. And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod. And I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. The word Mamzar in the Hebrew tongue means half-breed. Meaning, he doesn't belong there. He's illegitimate. He is the spurious Messiah. He's a fake. And he shall come, just as Christ told you back in Mark 13, making no apologies and uh, well uh, he, uh, he says uh, I sit as a king and you know another person that says I sit as a queen and am no widow verse 7 God doesn't approve you understand that and I will take away his blood out of his mouth. That's to say the sacrifices that he gathers in claiming to be God and the holy people bring him the holy offering and his abominations from between his teeth. But he that remaineth, even he shall be for our God, and he shall be as a governor in Judah, and Ekron as a Jebusite. That is to say, Ekron as uh, the Jebusites that built Jebus, which was the original name of Jerusalem. God intends to use a remnant. Do you know who that remnant is he's talking about here that will uh, stay with him, that will be for our God? It's God's elect that are not going to be taken in by the deception of these end times. Not at all. They know they don't have to go somewhere to worship God. That God is wherever uh, he chooses to be. I am that I am. Ia, Asha, Ia, Yahweh. And I'm simply saying the sacred name and the etymology thereof, which gives the message. Verse 8. And I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passeth by, and because of him that returneth, and no oppressor, that's no exactor, shall pass through them any more, for now have I seen with mine eyes um, the, um, because of him that returneth from where, comes out of the pit. The Mamzar. It's not going to do him any good. God intends to protect. That's what he's saying. Why should you fear when God says, I'm going to encamp 
Do you know what in camp means? That means I'm not going away. I'm there to stay. That's, that is um, God dwells there. Uh, Shekinah. The Shekinah glory, which simply means God dwells there in the Hebrew tongue. Verse 9. I don't want you to ever forget verse 9 and 10 of this chapter because many people will teach or try to teach that there is nothing written concerning the first and the second advent in the Old Testament. And make a mental note in your mind that chapter 9, verse 9 is first advent. Chapter 9, verse 10 in Zechariah is the second advent. And no person can tell you that the first and second advent was not written of in the Old Testament because it's right here in the restoration chapters of Jerusalem, of Israel. Verse 9, first advent. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Hosanna, I will add. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the fowl of an ass. These are the very words that came out as he sent a man and said, you will find an ass and the foal of an ass there. Bring them. Tell them the master has need of him. It was prearranged because of this scripture. This is, he's riding on the animal of a poor man. He came as a babe to bring salvation to the world. That's not the way he's going to be coming back in verse 10. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords to put things in order. Verse 10, second advent. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. That's the ten northern tribes, the larger. And the horse from Jerusalem. Any horse or power that comes against it is tied from the white steed that the very captain himself, Messiah, is riding. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen in his dominion. That's the area that he controls shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Second advent. Not, not coming this time to be crucified, but to restore order, to encamp around his people, to protect us that do his work. Well, uh, are we really supposed to do his work? Well, listen. Listen to the word of God. Verse 11. And for thee also, thee who? His children. Zion. By the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. There's no water of life. There's no, there's no place for one that has eternal life in the pit where those that will go to hell live. We have the eternal water, the water of life. Verse 12, turn you, that's return, turn you to the stronghold. Do you know where it's at, beloved, or do you live in fear? Do you know where the stronghold for God's children is? Ye prisoners of hope, do you have hope? You better have. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto you. That's the rewards of a first fruit. You've got nothing to worry about. Even today, you've got nothing to worry about other than fear itself. God encamps with those that, that uh, do his work. Well, well, what do they do? How do they do his work? Verse 13. When I have bent Judah for me, do you know what you bend? You bend a bow, all right? We're fixing, we're about to shoot an arrow, okay? Judah is my bow. Fill, fill the bow with Ephraim. That's the house of Judah and the house of Israel will be the arrows thereof. And raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, 
or Greece, which is uh, uh, Javan or Yavan. The heathen, all right? Not Greece as you would think of Greece. And made thee as the sword of a mighty man. That's what you're going to do. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that we were going to be a sword. Well, didn't Jesus say, if you don't have one, you better buy one? But what was he talking about? That's what the sword of the Lord. Don't you own one? You're in bad shape if you don't have a sword of the Lord. Have you never read uh, the great book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, to know what the sword of the Lord is? It's his tongue. And it's two-edged. It cuts both ways. It's called the truth. And you better be armed with the truth from this word. And that way the enemy will fall before you by the thousands. Uh, trying to bring lies upon our people and mislead them. When that bow of the house of Judah is loaded with the arrows of the house of the ten tribes, Israel, and is fired around the world of truth, the sword of the Lord, then the enemy falls greatly and the restoration of truth to this world is well underway. That's what you're supposed to do for the Lord. I thank our Heavenly Father that he's putting together the many-membered body of Christ truly, in reality, to see that this is done before that Manzar sits in Jerusalem claiming to be something he is not, to mislead, to destroy. Message, I've come to fly you away. Oh, glory. See that you don't listen to lies, friend. It's written. Have you read it? Well, where is it written that, that, that we're not supposed to fly? You've never read the book of Ezekiel. I'm disappointed in you. Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 18 through about 20. God says, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. I got work for them to do. They're going to be the bow and the arrows, the sword of the Lord. If they all run away, who's going to do it? They're supposed to be God's children. It is written. Have you read it? That's the way it's going down. And you should be forewarned. Verse 14. And the Lord shall be seen over them. Think about that statement. The Lord shall be seen over them. And his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. Zap. And the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, which one the last one, and shall go with the whirlwinds of the south. Uh, praise God. It's coming, my friend. Are you geared for it? The only way you can be is to be familiar with his word. I hope that you are. That's why we teach. That's why we, try, we lead. And that's why God sent us this letter, because he loves us. 15, the Lord of hosts shall defend them. There's no, no ifs, ands, or maybes. Defend them. And they shall devour and subdue with sling stones their weapons. And they shall drink and make a noise as through wine. They're, they will, the, the good things. And they shall be filled like bowls as and as the corners of the altar. The corners of the altar is where the blood was poured, but that's where also the horns of the altar, which means the power of the altar, blessed by God the Holy Spirit as his army moves forth, uh, conquering and preparing the many-membered body, the true temple of God in the end times. Verse 16, And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. Amen. For they shall be as the stones of a crown. What a compliment. Lifted up as an ensign upon his land. He's in charge. He's in control. He owns all the land. I don't know where, my friend, where are you going to be when all this happens? Are you going to be a part of it or are you going to let that Mamzar mislead you? And I can tell you where you're going if you allow that happen rather than to stick with Father who protects all, leads all,
teaches all, blesses all, you're going in the pit. And you'll have lots of company. And you know, well, well, I've always heard the majority say it's going to be this way. Well, have you ever thought, let, let me just ask you a question. I don't care what the majority thinks. It's what God thinks. And that had better be your frame of mind. You follow the majority and you're in for a heap of hurt, my friend. One to ten. Are you going to make your own mind up or are you going to follow the ten chasing after her? Go ahead. Hey, have a good trip. There'll be a lot on that trail. And they were warned coming out the gate. All they had to do was listen to our Father. Obey Him. You know, before you can participate in the sword of the Lord, which is truth, you've got to know the truth. You're not worth a flip if you don't know the truth. As far as carrying the sword of the Lord of truth. It's in the letter. It's simple. Children can understand it. And I thank God for them that have eyes to see and that have ears to hear. God's in control. He protects his own and he takes care of them. Verse 17 to complete the chapter. For how great is his goodness. You can't measure it. Unmeasurable. And how great is his beauty, the best. Nothing to compare. Corn shall make the young men cheerful. They'll flourish. And new wine, the maids. In other words, that simply means there will be happiness and plenty for everyone that follows him. Why? God owns everything. God takes care of his own. But let me ask you something. What is the wine symbolic of in this generation? Christ's blood. And he shed plenty of it to go around, my friend, to make us all happy. Simply by repenting and preparing the seedbed, your mind and body, to receive the rewards of salvation and the protection of God and to equip your mind with the word of God whereby that sword, the tongue from your mouth can come forth with the truth that cuts both ways against the Manzar that will stand in Jerusalem by allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through you as it is written in Mark 13. What a, what a time to live. This generation, the generation of the fig tree, and you're there. How precious. Oh, the beauty and oh the excellence of his goodness that he is good enough that he chooses common people to be able with eyes to see and ears to hear to know that truth he chose you see that you follow his word his way not men's talk to him he will always hear you when you're honest truthful why? He loves you. All right. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?